Lucy McCrudden here, Dance Mama, and I am so privileged and excited for the conversation that is about to ensue with a man who doesn't need very much introduction. It's Principal of the Royal Ballet, Stephen McRae, and Dance Papa Extraordinaire. Now, some of you who are a kind of au fait with the dance world will know that Stephen is part of what I like to call a dancing dynasty as his wife is also a dancer in the same company. She's a soloist, Elizabeth. And um, Stephen hails originally from Australia. He's a multi-award winning dancer. He's been an international guest artist all over the world for companies like American Ballet Theatre, Hong Kong Ballet, The Works. And um, it is an absolute thrill and a pleasure to be speaking to you, Stephen, if I'll let you speak. <laughs> <laughs> so Stephen give me just give us a brief overview of your family setup just in general we are in pandemic times but just kind of just in general yeah well this is the most bizarre and surreal moment right now because I'm sat in my living room and there's nobody else in the house which that just never happens so um yeah everybody is out my daughter's at school uh Audrey she is five and my two boys, Frederick, who's three, he'll be four this week, and Rupert is one. Um, so Frederick and Rupert are currently at the playground with Mama, <laughs> uh -huh. um, just to give us a moment to be able to talk. Um, but they'll probably come racing through the door <laughs> anytime, so who knows. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of energy in this house. Uh, obviously, both Liz and I, being dancers with the Royal Ballet, during lockdown and things like that, you know, we had to keep in shape and training. Um, I'm returning from a very serious injury that I had last season. I, I snapped my Achilles. So juggling the rehab side with obviously everything else that goes on in life has been a huge task. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I think energy breeds energy. Um, you know, everybody who's a parent out there knows that it is the most rewarding thing you'll ever do, but it's also the most exhausting thing you'll ever do. Um, and you know full well, some days, if you just feel like your energy is really quite low and down, somehow your kids can just inject you with this unknown energy and suddenly you're like, okay, it's fine. We're doing this and we're going and actually we're all fine. Everyone's fine. Um, so, you know, I think we're like all families. You have your days where you're like this and you're like that. Um, and I think all parents probably just constantly think you're doing the wrong thing <laughs> as parents, you know, this household's no different. You always try and do your absolute best. Yeah. Um, but there is no such thing as the perfect parent. So I think strip away all the ballet and stuff like that. And we are just like everyone else. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, in terms of your kind of uh, work environment, there are quite a few parents that are all ballet. So mm. do you feel that it's, it's, it appears obviously having worked there and then being external, quite a supportive environment for that. Um, but with both of you, ha when we were pre-pandemic, how, how would that work? Yeah, so realistically, um, whether an organisation is supportive or not, Realistically, our profession, being professional dancers with a company that is one of the busiest companies in the world, performing quite an insane schedule, um, realistically, the two worlds are just not compatible. Yeah. They are not compatible in any way. Um, I don't have any family on this side of the world. My entire family is in Australia, and my wife's family is all up in Yorkshire. So we do not have a single family member <laughs> anywhere near us um, to, you know, it sounds silly, but you don't have that person that you can just call at the last second and say, ah, oh, we're stuck. Yeah. Could you please do this? Uh, that just doesn't exist in our world. Yeah. So um, before pandemic and stuff like that, when we're both performing at a full schedule with no maternity leave or no injuries, uh, we've always had to rely on a full-time nanny yeah. because the, you know, childcare, as everybody will know, is the most extortionate thing on the planet and um because of our insane schedules we uh we need total wraparound care you know sometimes we might leave the house at eight in the morning and uh very often won't be home till midnight 
Yeah. And uh, that's, you know, you can't rely on a nursery or um, you know, a daycare center or, you know, a child minder to do that because you would still need an additional person to do the pickup or do the after hours. Mm -hmm. um, so a full-time nanny has only ever been the way that we've been able to go, um, which is, it's quite an extravagant <laughs> way to go, but it is genuinely the only way um, with our particular profession to make it work because our profession schedule also changes at the click of a finger as well. You know, suddenly somebody's injured and you have to pick up an extra show. Um, yeah. And if you're constantly having to source out an additional nanny by the hour um, and things like that happen, it's just not realistic and it's not always possible to find someone at late short notice. So uh, mm -hmm. full-time nanny is the only way we've only ever been able to do it. Um, obviously with injuries and maternity leave and things, we've not had to do that for a while. We've been able to, to juggle it between us and we've loved that to be honest. You know, I feel like with our schedules, when you are performing all the time and rehearsing all the time, you almost become, and I feel like a lot of people will be able to relate to this, whether you're a dancer or any industry, you almost become a little bit like an accessory to your own life. Mm -hmm. You're not actually living that life. You just, you flit in and then you think, oh, I've only got an hour with the children. So you, you do a full three act ballet for them in that one hour and you make up for the whole day in that one hour and you put so much pressure on everything's got to be amazing for that one hour. And um, you lose touch of like silly things. What's going on in the house? Who needs what? What's going on tomorrow at school? Okay, plan ahead, plan ahead. You're not able to do that as well when you are performing every single day, rehearsing every day, and you have to rely on a nanny and people like that to do things. Um, so we've really enjoyed being able to, sounds crazy, but to be able to take full control again of our own lives with our children. So yeah. um, in a sh short answer, going back to your, your question, realistically, it's not possible <laughs> to do, to have our crazy profession uh, as it is currently with parenthood, um, there's a huge area that needs to open up there in order to make the profession um, possible for particularly mums to mm. carry on performing and working, but perhaps not doing it six days a week. Yeah. Um, it's a physical profession that sports science is screaming out to us saying, you shouldn't be doing what you're doing six days a week. What you're doing as dancers is not right. It's not healthy. It's not good for you in any way. Um, recovery and rest is the most crucial thing of any active profession. And uh, unfortunately, in the world of dance, that just does not exist. It's just been the culture for years and years and years that it just hasn't played a part in it. And obviously, as parents, there's no such thing as rest either. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a huge world there to, to be opened up and discussed about, you know, particularly mums, but also fathers, perhaps taking on part-time roles in these professions where physically it'll actually do you a far greater benefit having a day in between to rest. Um, it means that you are not totally stepping away from parenthood and you're also still pursuing your career as well. Um, so I, I think that's a discussion that I hope um, will really start to happen. And you know, all this working from home, many industries now are changing the way that they're working. So I hope that it also enables our industry to start having discussions about this as well. Because you know, like any profession, if you really want to climb the ladder of that world, you have to sacrifice a lot, of course, and the work-life balance always becomes a bit unbalanced because you're climbing that ladder, climbing that ladder. Um, but there does come a point where you have to step back and say, is this actually healthy? And do you have to sacrifice having a family just to pursue a career? Yeah. No, the answer is no. There is every possibility in the world that we can all be doing both. It's just having those open discussions um, setting it out. How is it possible? How can we make this happen? Um, because unfortunately, I feel like in many professions, the second that somebody wants to have a family or, you know, if somebody become, if a, if a, a lady becomes pregnant and, and wants to become a mum, the initial assumption is, oh, she doesn't want the career anymore. Yeah. And it's absolutely ludicrous because 
for a mother to walk back into their workplace, especially a profession like dance, mm. if anything, it's showing people that actually this performer wants it more than ever because they've just had to leave their three month old at home, which we all know is the most impossible thing to do. Um, so it's flipping that mentality or the way that parents are seen as well in the industry. Um, having a child is not a hindrance <laughs> and it's not, oh, this is annoying now, like, oh, they're not reliable or they're not this. No, actually, like if they're returning to work, these people are a huge asset to you. They really want it more than ever. So um, it's just continuing ways of support into like a new way of thinking, really. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> Kevin, O'Hare, Kevin O'Hare, our director of the Royal Ballet, has always been incredibly supportive of, of Liz and I. And every time we've gone in there and told him that we're having a child, you know, it, it's, it's wonderful to see your boss, you know, well up and get, you know, obviously emotionally excited and happy for you. Um, that's absolutely wonderful. But the culture as a whole, um, I think, needs to have big discussions about how we can really genuinely make this work. Because you know, I think perhaps Liz and I have just appeared as like, excuse the pun, but like swans on top. Oh yes, they're just doing it, they're just doing it. But actually we're frantically making it work behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't need to be that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've hit on so many thing, points there, particularly the support network. Funnily enough, I have a similar s situation in that my parents are up north and the rest of the family is over in o Australia. So I <laughs> totally get it. And having um, that consistency where you've got two consuming roles, basically, both your, your career and your parenting career, both have have that um, kind of expectation but you're absolutely right in terms of physical load from what we know totally um, dancers are exceptionally high and as you say trying to find ways of integrating that and also really getting that value from mm. I think also when you're pushed for time when you have got that working time like you say you do actually invest so much more in it because you know yeah. you've only got that little window of time to get to get everything done um but that pressure can be quite um sometimes overwhelming and I can imagine sort of when you're mid-season um that can that can be a, a huge challenge but having another person there in, in the mix um, yeah to really support you is is really helpful i think as well kind of i see the royal ballet is kind of the rolls royce of how how parents can be supported and treated in the industry but translates quite differently if you're an independent artist without those support networks now i suppose what i'm trying to do parents in performing arts are trying to do is to try and build those support networks and information for people around around them where they don't have so much organizational support and are having to work on their own reliance but definitely it's 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 couples like you and families like you that i think are really inspiring and really help to give such a positive um role model that it, mm. it can be done and it doesn't have to be ooh, shiny and unusual. It, it, can, it can be the norm. It's just absolutely how, how it's managed. Um, yeah, and it's having those discussions and being open about it as well. I think there's also a fear that if you do choose to have a child in this profession, that when you do return to work, you have to return exactly like you were before and don't cause any issues, don't ask for anything, um, you know, look as if you're exactly the same as you were when you're 18, when you joined the company, um, but you just happen to have a child at home. And that's just not realistic. And I think it's, it's being confident in yourself enough to be able to have those discussions with your management to say, listen, you know, I really want this more than ever, but can we have a discussion about other ways of making it work? Um, you know, how can I be more productive for you as an organization, but then it will also work for me. Um, you know, I think, for example, if, if a ballerina was in there three days a week, but really was there three days a week, it would be great. You would get a lot out of them. Wonderful. Then they have their recovery days. They're with their children. Um, they don't become swamped um, 
you know, if there are 30 Swan Lakes, okay, you only do 15. And yeah. the prospect of that mum thinking, okay, it's fine, it's only 15 evenings. It doesn't matter how much you want to be on that stage. If you know that there is a run of 30 Swan Lakes and you're on every night, you will not see your children. There is every possibility when there's a six or seven week show week, uh, six, six or seven performance week, I mean, um, that Liz would leave home on a Monday morning and not see the children till Sunday morning. Yeah. Because obviously being on stage every night and early starts for class and things like that, it's just not realistic. You don't, you don't bring children in the world to not see them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I've heard some people say, yeah, but you know what you're signing up for. But I disagree with that statement because many dancers start dancing when they're very young. You know, Liz joined the Royal Ballet School, well, the associate program when she was eight and joined the, the White Lodge when she was 11. You have no idea what you're signing up for at that age. You don't know if you want children or not children or things like that. So that mentality, I think, has to be erased immediately. Um, because you can't just get stuck in the way that things have been or, oh, you knew that it was going to be a crazy profession. Um, again, it just doesn't have to be like that. It's just having those open discussions about how can we actually move forward with this and yes. it might work even better than it did before, you know? Yeah. I mean, do you, do you find being a parent actually kind of in terms of your, the acting that is required in your job? to connect on a deeper level with audiences because you've got different life experience of, of being oh, yeah. a parent. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, I've noticed a few different moments. There was one that really hit me actually. Um, the very final scene of Sir Kenneth MacMillan's Miling. Um, yeah. and for anyone who hasn't seen it, Miling is very dark ballet and it's very dramatic ballet. Um, and it was, it's, it's one of the few ballets where the central role is a male. And, uh, you know, you follow his journey through the whole ballet and he slowly deteriorates because there's psychological issues and there's drugs and it's, you know, all the bad things in life that everybody says don't do, it's all in one ballet, basically. Different and uh, Cracker, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely not Nutcracker. <laughs> and um, basically at the end, it's unfortunately, it's a double suicide. And um, there's a scene where the lead character, so myself, comes forward with a gun and you have to hold it to your throat. And it was the most bizarre thing because obviously you're so in character that you even forget what your, your real name is at this point. You, you genuinely think you are yeah. Crown Prince Rudolph or whoever you're playing on, in that ballet. And this particular scene, I was there and I had the gun and I'm walking forward and I was pointing it to my head. And suddenly my children just flashed in front of my eyes. Wow. And I just burst out into tears because I thought I could never, ever, ever, ever do this. Like, there's no way. And these tears were just coming down my eye, out of, down my face. And that was purely just yeah. the impact of the children and what that would entail. And um, it was awful. Like, I just... I felt like I just cr like crumbled on stage. I mean, it's the end of the ballet and you mentioned- Amazing performance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, and I genuinely hadn't even processed that thought in rehearsals or anything, because you're just so focused on the details and things. And um, yeah, there are just so many little moments where it just, it's having children, what that does to you and your outlook on everything. It just changes everything. and. I, you know, it sounds awful to say, unless you've had children, you just don't understand. But that kind of sensation, that feeling, it is just the truth. You know, it's, yeah. I don't know how to compare it, but I guess like if somebody is trying to explain to you what it's like to skydive or something like that, if you haven't skydived, you just don't actually get it. You don't understand. Um, and yeah, it's just, I think my whole, my, my temperament has changed with many different things. Um, certain things have become more heightened. Um, there's different pressures put on you as a parent as well. You know, my career was obviously pursued through a genuine love of dance and what it did to me. It just, 
it transformed me from this shy little boy into someone that was like, yeah, I just want to absolutely perform and go for it. And I don't care what anybody thinks and all this sort of stuff. And it's brought me to the other side of the world. And then obviously I met Liz and all this sort of stuff. And then suddenly when you have kids, there's a very different responsibility. It's not a case of, oh, this is just my career and my passion and I'm just going to absolutely pursue it. It becomes more than that. It becomes, oh, my passion, my career is actually supporting my children. It's my livelihood. It's more than just me absolutely loving that feeling of being on stage. So it adds very different, um, different pressure, I guess, gets put on your shoulders and it makes you view the profession with very different eyes as well. So perhaps things that you would normally have just let go before, extra rehearsal put in here or an extra show here, an extra show there, you then suddenly think of it in a different way and go, oh, hang on, that's taking me away from my children or no, 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 I'd planned to do this. And I guess in some ways you become less flexible, but then as a parent, you have to be extremely flexible because you're constantly juggling. So yeah. Um, your tolerances for different things, <laughs> um, I think, change. I think, again, you've kind of hit on a, a few times that kind of tension between the tradition, tradition of ballet and kind of the, those perceptions of it and the kind of hierarchical perceptions versus mo modern day life, what it means to be a human in the 21st century. Yeah that you're also through your art form trying to connect with modern day audiences through classical work and more con contemporary work but also mm -hmm. living in in that context and um i think as you sort of said before having that empowerment and feeling empowered to talk to to your employers to have those open conversations i think is something that i really hope that um more people can start to feel that because I think there's still sometimes a real tension around that of people not feeling that they can have those conversations for fear of their career being either halted in some way or, or held, held back. Yeah. Uh, but for all of the wonderful reasons you're talking about, um, parents in a company, um, I think we are a, a good five years into now really bringing that conversation up to the top of the agenda and rather than it being something hidden mm. um, like you say that kind of you know what's the phrase is it parent like you're not working and work like you're not a parent is yeah, exactly. gonna kind of um start to, to dissipate a bit really um, yeah, i mean look at countries like norway for example where parenthood is just totally it's totally expected yeah so you know, you know, the ballet company over there have different, uh, different um, protocols, so, so to speak, in place where parents, it's just the norm that at a certain time they leave and they can go get their children or, you know, there are different things in place that it's just, it's just, um, it's supported. It is just there. It's not special treatment. You're not asking for a favor or anything. That is just how it's done. Yeah. And I, I really do hope that in time that that's what will start to happen in this country as well. Yeah, I mean, definitely in terms of uh, the, the Royal Ballet, particularly because you have got so many more parents there. I think also because you've got a larger amount of people, a larger company, so there's more kind of um, hands to, to guide in that in that way. Mm -hmm. But I think it, it really does demonstrate that it absolutely is more more than possible in terms of your kind of skill and understanding and training did mm. that kind of um give you a different insight into elizabeth's pregnancies or her rehabilitation or think about those in a different way that perhaps gents who haven't had such a physical career might mm. think about things uh, yeah i mean I don't think anything in the world ever prepares you for watching your wife in labor. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, as the man, you're totally useless. You are just useless. Um, there's absolutely nothing you can do um, other than just try and look supportive at the time. Um, but I think, you know, watching Liz each time when she was pregnant, continuing to train in a very safe way. She didn't 
she never went crazy she wasn't doing pirouettes on point or anything like that she just just kept her body moving because any time that she had a few weeks where she said actually i'm not going to do anything she actually felt worse yeah um, because obviously your body's just used to moving and things like that and that's what the doctors always advise you anyway just continue yeah. doing what you were doing before you were pregnant yeah. so she was very smart each time and each time coming back as well she was also incredibly smart in allowing her body to just do its thing not rush it not trying to speed it along and um, not you know not trying to be unrealistic about it um you know when i look at it and think back she was back on stage in the real world so quickly <laughs> each time um but that was purely just led by her and listening to her body. She wasn't forcing it to do something it wasn't ready for. Yeah. Um, and ultimately that, that really helped her because then once she was back on stage, she stayed on stage and she didn't have to keep stopping and starting to try and fix something. Um, and I think that's something that she herself would definitely say to any dancers out there that are about to have babies or want to have babies is there's no rush. There's no panic. It's, the human body needs to do its thing and um especially after giving birth you know i really just witnessed her allowing her body to do its thing let let it all just happen you know don't uh, artificially rush it along or you know force it back into those point shoes what for <laughs> let it do its thing <laughs> Yeah. And I, I think as well, kind of just going back to, to your being modest about the, <laughs> the value you add when you're there in the labour suite, I think, I think particularly now where thankfully, I think this second lockdown, chaps are or partners yeah. are allowed in the labour suite. Um, yeah. I think I crushed probably my husband's hands during my second labour as I had a million pound 11 whopper. Um, so I absolutely needed him, him there for that. Um, so don't underestimate that, I think. Um, <laughs> I think the other kind of, I suppose the other physical, I would call it my public enemy number one as a parent is sleep deprivation. And oh my God, yeah. I find just the science behind sleep deprivation anyway, like kind of grimly fascinating. <laughs> <Please>. <laughs> Um, I couldn't see them um, but I guess ha, ha, did that affect you oh yeah I mean how before, did you manage it yeah well, before we had children I guess like any dancer in the company you know everybody's you become very um very routine about things and you know before a show like I need to sleep like a certain amount of hours and you know, I need to have this kind of meal the night before and then during the day I'll eat these things and all this sort of stuff. And then suddenly, obviously, when our first, so when Audrey was born, um, I think, I can't remember how quickly it was, but it was very soon after she was born, I was performing, you know, full length ballets and things. And, you know, with a newborn, you're lucky if you get more than two hours consecutively of yeah. sleep. And, you know, I've always said from day one, we're doing this together. So it's not a case of, oh, just go sleep in another room and shut the door. That doesn't work in my head. I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing that. And I know many people do it because that's the only way they can do it. Um, and I guess if I were a brain surgeon, I'd probably go and do that because I wouldn't want to be operating on somebody's brain <laughs> to have a sleep. But I, I've always said like, I know I'm not interested in doing that. Like, it's two of us doing this. So um, I've done numerous shows of Don Q and Romeo and things like that, where you genuinely have had two hours total sleep. Um, our second child, so Frederick, um, for the first 14 months of his life, uh, we just genuinely did not sleep. We never slept through once. Um, he was very uncomfortable and eventually, eventually, eventually um, was diagnosed with, um, like a dairy allergy and all this sort of stuff. And as soon as we were given dairy-free formula and all that, he slept the whole night through. We did the typical parent thing of, has he died? Because we just were not used to him sleeping. Um, so and it was a free lion these days. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it was just, it was the most bizarre thing to then suddenly sleep all the, all the way through. We felt like we could run a marathon all of a sudden. It was the most euphoric <laughs> experience of our life 
Um, but then you, you realize then what sleep deprivation does to you. And that was around the time when a lot of my injuries started to happen and things like that. Um, it went hand in hand. My work schedule was crazy. And then obviously I was not sleeping or recovering in any way. I was living off air basically. Um, so it all goes hand in hand eventually. And, you know, something has to give. And my body was the thing that probably <laughs> gave in first. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know really how else to, to say I coped with it because you just do. That was the ad, that was our scenario. And yeah, you have a choice. Like that was my job to get up and do a full length of Romeo. Yeah. Um, whether I had two hours or 10 hours sleep, uh, the show had to <laughs> happen. That was my job. So, um, do you feel, I, I, I guess, I think there's a certain quality that dancers have though, of kind of really pushing themselves to mm. the edges of humanity <laughs> to, to enable them to do, you know, and for you to do what you've been doing. But I guess in a practical sense, was it things like just making sure your diet that you had plenty of carbohydrate to keep, to keep you going and, and, and things like that. Just yeah. thinking for any of the other dance pappers out there who at some point will hopefully be in a tricky situation yeah, <laughs> where, yeah. where they'll have lots yeah. of shows and to try and find yeah, ways. I think you, nutrition has to be number one yeah. because, um, you know, I, I was purely eating to survive. I wasn't really, I don't think I was eating in a way that fueled me fully. Yeah. I was literally just eating to survive, to get through the next hour, to get through the next rehearsal, to get through the next show. Mm -hmm. um, I genuinely was functioning in that way. And um, I, it's kind of terrifying now when I look back uh, at five years ago. So Audrey was you know, about to turn one. So it was my first year as a father. Um, and performing like a madman. And uh, it terrifies me to think, how did that even happen? How did I, I get through it? And as I just said, it's because I was genuinely just basically functioning to get through what needed to happen at that specific time. So I would literally know, okay, I have this hour and a half rehearsal that's really tough. So I would eat this, 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 and then go in and just do it. And then be like, okay, what's next? okay, I have a show tonight, so I need to eat this just to get through the show. And I would finish the show absolutely on zero, like nothing left. It was, it was an effort just to get home. How are you um, <laughs> yeah. And then of course, like you would get home and, you know, be home at midnight. And then, you know, maybe my daughter was awake and needed a bottle. So instead of Liz getting out of bed to do it, I was awake from the show. So I would do the bottle and, you know, whatever. And, um, you know, Audrey, our first was also not a great sleeper. Um, so it was normal that every night one of us would be down here with Toy Story on the TV at 3 a.m. because she was up, wired, wanting to go, go, go. And um, we had this sort of like playpen that we would put her in. We would lay in there with her and just put cushions everywhere and try and sleep whilst Toy Story was playing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody who's written a parenting book will be listening to this going, oh my God, that's like the worst thing you could do. But we had to do whatever we had to do to survive and function at that point. Yeah. Um, and so it meant that Toy Story was on every night at about 3 a.m. And one night I would be in the playpen with the pillows and then the next night it would be Liz in the playpen with the pillows. So um, I think we were I get to be child that sleeps properly or, or through the night at all as a baby I, I, I think it's complete I don't think it exists yeah I mean we always just thought oh maybe we're doing something really wrong because we had friends that were like yeah we're just you know it's fine they sleep I think well ours don't <laughs> and then um Rupert so our third came along and we went through a real long period of time when he was born where he actually did sleep. And we actually thought, wow, these babies do exist. <laughs> it's not a myth. You know, maybe those people weren't making it up. 
Um, he doesn't sleep anymore, of course. He wakes up two times <laughs> every night for a bottle and things like that. Um, but yeah, sleep deprivation, I understand fully why it was used as a form of torture. Yeah. And uh, every parent out there will totally relate. <laughs> I think also as well, there's a th I think there's definitely something in the neuromuscular memory because your body has been conditioned to be in those positions and move through those positions for such a, for such a long time in your life. I, I would imagine that kind of that kicks in mm. second nature, but I would... Yeah, I, I, I still kind of would love, love to do some kind of dance science study on kind of the absorbing of new information or new choreography when you're going through that. Because, I mean, no. on a kind of just a general level, I would do things like leave the house without shoes on and, you know, <laughs> just kind of... This, my brain would be all over the place. Um, I mean, I've done many things on the way home, for example, where... Uh, we live in Kew Gardens on the district line, so the last stop then is Richmond. And quite a few times, it, the train is pulled in to Kew Gardens, and I've looked, the door has opened, I've read it, Kew Gardens, mm -hmm. doors closed, and then the train continues on. I think, oh, I actually didn't get off the train. <laughs> yeah, okay, go to Richmond, change trains, go back home. Um, and that's purely because you go into this zombie land yeah. um, and it's sort of that, you know, that act of preservation, you know, so I can sit still for 20 minutes and not do anything. So you go into this slight, yeah. hey, the, do not move, don't think, don't do anything, <laughs> try and get some energy back and then boom, okay, on to the next thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think going back to the whole literally surviving to do what's needed at that point. Yeah. Um, I Be think yeah. many parents do that, you know, you just do it to get through that bit and that next bit and da, 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 da. And that's fine for a short period of time, but obviously in a profession like ours, you can't function like that for a long period of time because something will, will end up giving up. <laughs> um, so, you know, like walking into a rehearsal with someone like Wayne McGregor, who, he works at such an incredible speed and he challenges you. And, you know, I absolutely love going into rehearsals with him. But they're the rehearsals that realistically you should never walk into if you've only had two hours sleep. Yeah. But the reality yeah. was that's all I was ever getting. So I just had to, you know, have four coffees or have this, have that, and just, ugh, okay, focus for this one and a half hours and just, duh, 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 duh. um, my, my wife laughs because she always says that I actually have this ability to just compartmentalize and okay, I'm now doing this and I'm now doing that. Um, and then she says she's the opposite. She finds that very difficult to, to compartmentalize. Like if she's with the children, but she's thinking of a show she's going to have to do tomorrow night, she can't separate the two. Yeah. And I think my way of dealing with it has been to like really put down the walls and be like, right, I'm now with the children, like ballet doesn't exist, like boom, I'm, I'm like for them, 110% for them. Um, and then vice versa, when I'm at work, I have to go, I'm here at work, I'm going to do what I need to do, I need to get everything out of it, um, and then leave. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's just very different approaches, isn't it? It's different, different ways of dealing with it. But for both of you, it seems to work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, do you feel what kind of advice would you give to anyone who is consider is a dad or a partner and is considering to be a parent or is one um what would be your top tips <laughs> um to be really realistic with yourself you know it's uh it's not realistic to just think that you will float through your career and, and float through parenthood. Um, you know, as a performer, you always know that some shows are, are better than others. Some shows you just think, I want to press delete and never, ever, ever think about that night again. Um, and obviously when you are tired and things like that from being a parent, the feelings and all that around those particular moments become even more exaggerated. Mm. And so, 
it's again just sort of taking a bit of that pressure off yourself um we all are going to try and obviously do our best in whatever scenario it is we all want to be the best possible parents we can be and you know be the best at our jobs that, that we possibly can be as well but the reality is sometimes you might just not be that good <laughs> at that particular point in time um allow yourself to have those moments as well you know like if if i feel like i'm just being a bit swamped in the house um liz is very good at just like let's diffuse the situation a bit let's change the mood and vice versa if i come in and i can see that liz is a bit like <laughs> you know i'm like right let's like do this let's change it all around and let's just you know i think um anyone who's entering the world of parenthood if you can make sure that you have an incredible partner with you who um you can you know fuel each other you can balance each other out um you just need someone who's on the same wavelength as you because yeah. Yeah. you know it's like i said at the very beginning it's the most rewarding thing you'll ever do but it's the most challenging thing you'll ever do and as i've also said until you've actually become a parent you genuinely just cannot even put your head where it will take you <laughs> yeah yeah i i think as well it's just um what one of the things i suppose in terms of having employers that aren't parents and try trying to open those lines of communication mm -hmm. just kind of trying to i guess articulate as best as possible that there's no off button for the the parenting no um, at all it is a total 24 7 job and um like you well, said yeah, because we've had people say oh but you've got a full-time nanny so why doesn't the nanny get up at 2 a.m when the the child's crying i think well because a i'm the father and b they're not employed to do that. They're, they're employed to look after the children when we're out of the house. But my rule always was the second I walk in the house, thank you very much. Like yeah. you're done. The, the nanny finishes for the day. Um, because that, again, that was just always, it's always been my thing that I chose to bring those children into the world. So they're my responsibility. <laughs> um, which of course, you know, it's a double-edged sword that because you're employing somebody to help you and I'm actually sending them away. <laughs> but when it comes to like a 2 a.m. wake up or something, I want the child to see mummy or daddy. I don't want them to see another person. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, that's very clear, yeah. isn't it? And the, the, the authority structure is mm. clear and, and um, that makes it much easier all round, doesn't it? I think very yeah. good. I've got lo lots of uh, taking lots of boundary lessons off you, Stephen. Very good, very very <laughs> good. Um, I guess this is going to be a tricky question. Now we're sort of nearing the end, but tricky question because we're on kind of it's November the third. It's U.S. Election Day. What? <laughs> so God knows what's going to happen. Um, we're just about to enter another lockdown. What kind of? <laughs> have you got a crystal ball Stephen what, <laughs> what kind of can you see in the future or if you we can't say it tangibly what would we like to see <laughs> um I don't know if you saw yesterday but there was I can't it was somewhere in Europe I want to say the Netherlands but I could be wrong but there was a train or a tram that was nearing the end of its line and it overshot and it's basically raised up and there's an art installation with a whale's tail sticking up at the end and the train overshot and this art installation caught the train and saved the train from totally derailing fully. Amazing. And I thought, I thought wow, that best represents <laughs> what art does for the world beyond what everybody says the arts does. And um, I really do feel that the art world, whether that's performing arts or, you know, visual arts, whatever it is that you want to do, the music, whatever it is, um, is really going to explode again once we finally can, you know, open the world up. Because more than ever, people are going to realize just how important it is 
what is the point of living these lives if we're not fulfilled beyond the usual nine to five of life? Yes. Um, and that's what the arts do. That's every time you turn the TV on, that's yeah. because artists, creatives have put that together. Every yeah. time you go to the cinema, the theater, that is art. <laughs> art is sofa. everywhere. Like your sofa that you're sitting on has been designed by a designer who is a creative. Um, and I think people will hopefully um, not give it the credit it deserves, but just acknowledge the value of what all of those professions do and create for the, for the whole world. Um, in terms of our children, I am just very aware that, you know, we try and expose them to as much as possible. But the reality is I don't want to put them on the tube and take them into this museum and that museum and to this gallery and that gallery right now, because I just don't feel safe doing that with my children. Yeah. Um, and so I am very aware that as soon as things are open again and safe, um, that there is a lot that I just want to take them out there and explore and, you know, get involved with, um, little activities after school you know I'm not a fan of sending the children off every day to something mm. uh, after school you know my daughter's exhausted when she comes home from school so you know she still doesn't do an activity after school yet nobody goes off to any lesson or anything yeah uh, we have a enough energy in our house doing stuff um, but in time you know she's showing a big interest in tennis and things like that and um, all of that's just been put on hold obviously because of all of this so I see, I see a lot of joy and happiness that is coming our way because then we'll actually appreciate all these incredible things that are, are there for us to explore. And, you know, a museum, an art gallery, it doesn't cost anything to do that, but it can transform your life. Like a child looking at a particular painting or going to a performance in a theater is, it has genuinely the ability to transform their whole outlook on everything. And um, I'm excited for those moments to happen. Well, you've definitely raised my vibes and made me <laughs> a bit more, a uh, bit more <laughs> joyful at look, looking forward to that. And, and I guess, yeah, we only look at history post the, um, you know, Spanish flu, then you've got yeah, the twenties yeah. and everybody absolutely going for it. And um yeah, I think particularly now that I think in some ways art is so good that it has bled into absolutely everything. That's why some people who aren't necessarily in touch with it can't see it. It's invisible yeah. because it's so it's so good. It's absolutely yeah, yeah. everywhere and, and really kind of I, I love what you said. Definitely. I, I saw that image with the train. Actually, it is. That is a beautiful metaphor. And yeah. Um, a, love, a lovely way to end. What a delightful conversation. <laughs> well, it's been That's a pleasure. Brilliant. And everybody listening, I really hope you've, you've enjoyed it as much as, as I have and just learning more about kind of just getting a window in S Stephen and Elizabeth's lives of ha how everything works. Probably a question you often are, ask yourselves when you're watching them. How are they well, making I'm a in this house? <laughs> And um, we just, you know, sending you so much support and love and, you know, keep going with everything. Um, we, we have to really. And I think luckily for, for these times, dancers are resilience is one of the things that we're actually, we're quite good at because we know it takes lots of attempts to get things absolutely right. And you just, you know, you just have to keep going, don't you, until exactly. we get there. What inspirational chat. Stephen, thank you. Pleasure. I will now, take care. All right, thank you very much. Bye.